Boito location Konoin constituency, Bomet County. It is a village of relatively high poverty and low literacy levels. Small scale tea farming is the main economic activity here. Just the perfect setting for Gregory Hayes Dow and his wife Mary Rose Dow to undertake their charity work. About a kilometer off the Konoin Litane Road in Kapsiratet, the couple leased this one and a half acre property. They set up an orphanage equipped with a school and a church, which were both run by Gregory as director, teacher, and pastor. They called it the Dow Family Children's Home. Hi, Davis. Davis Bett worked for the Dows as a manager of the home from 2008 to 2013. For five years, he witnessed everything that happened here. When they first came, this building was there because this used to be a second school for a, for a neighbor here with them offering a teach. He tried to intervene when he thought things were inappropriate, but that eventually cost him his job. I had suspected that something is wrong with uh, Gregory and uh, and he used to tell me that uh, Davis, I'm not a good person all the time until I asked him one day that, uh, why do you say that uh, you know, he wasn't a good person? He told me that uh, back in the US, uh, he had already been jailed over uh, assault. He said that uh, he had confrontation with his former wife and uh, he was put in jail. And uh, he also told me that uh, he was using uh, the, the hard drugs. Eh? Mm -hmm. But he said that uh, when he came back from the prison, he got saved and uh, He's not using all that anymore. But something was wrong. He also had uh, the behavior of uh, you know, swapping the guns on their butts. Eh? Mm -hmm. you know, it's inappropriate for us here. And I told Gregory, it's not good for you to do that. He said, ah, it's, who cares about that? You know? Gregory's mild sexual advances were often overlooked. But soon after, these advances progressed to full-blown defilement of the girls who were aged between 10 and 15 years old at the time taking away their innocence. Beatrice, not her real name and whose real identity we have concealed, has just returned home for the midterm school break. She is received with a loving embrace by her family. It is the kind of care she never had during her nine years stay at the Dow family home. <laughs> <laughs> Alongside her younger brother, the 16-year-old joined the home in 2008 as an orphan aged just six. Her experiences there are memories she'd rather forget. Sexual abuse, she says, was difficult to bear. I was in, a, like, in one of the corners, so I couldn't hear him coming in and close the other doors. What happened then? And then after that, he, like, he came behind me, started opening up my shirt. Then I tra like I held on to my shirt so no nothing can happen to me. Then he told me if you do if you stop moving if if you won't stop moving I'm gonna like slap you. Then I just had to stop moving, but I I blocked my shirt from being opened. Then like he tried to open my skirt because I had a skirt that could open. He opened my skirt. Then I I was laying on the ground. He told me if you don't be quiet because I was crying. He told me if you don't be quiet I'm just gonna kill you. How many times? Were you sexually abused by Mr. Dow? I was like three times. Did you ever report this matter to anyone? If you try to talk to anybody about this, you like, and they realize about it, you'll get into further trouble, and it's not going to be easy because there's too many punishments that you get, and you can't undertake them. In your estimation, how many girls went through this? For the girls, the Kenyan girls I know about, there's seven. Then there are two twin daughters, the black Americans, with whom they adopted from the U.S. I'm at this smiling. A few meters from Beatrice's home is Nancy's family farmhouse. It's not her real name, and we have concealed her identity as well. Here, Nancy and her two younger brothers were taken up by the Dows at a tender age. She removed her clothes and then Gregory slept, slept on top of her. Then we, we, we were seeing that they were doing just with Gregory. 
Then I went to and who was a worker there. Then I told her that it's being raped by Gregor. Did not believe so she she, she just kept, kept quiet. The next day again, Gregor was strong. He took and he came and called one of the girls whose name was and he took her upstairs, we followed her again. Then we were outside the bush and our people what's going on. Then she asked again, Are you giving me are you going to give me something? Then she said yes. Then Gregory told her to remove all her clothes and told her to sleep on the bed. Then then we just saw Gregory sleeping on top of Then we can call one of the teachers whose name was Madame. But she did not believe, so we just kept quiet to ourselves and knew that she was being raped. So we, we just kept quiet. The next day again, he took, he took one of the girls again, whose name was and he did the same thing. <laughs> In what appears to be a well-orchestrated scheme, the Dows hatched and executed a plan to prevent the minors from getting pregnant. Mary Rose, Gregory's wife, had the girls aged between 10 and 15 years old on birth control. She brought the girls here to Mogogo Sheik Health Center, a government facility where the birth control implants were inserted under their skin. When we got there, we were sitting at the family planning door. So I was wondering, why are we here? What are we doing here? Then she told me, you're going to get an implant in. So I tried to ask her, what does this all mean? Why, why do I need to get that in and what is it? They, they didn't like explain to me what it meant and everything. So like when we got in, Mary Rose went in to speak to the doctor. When they were done, she called me in. Then when she was speaking to the doctor again, she clogged my ears so I couldn't hear what they were talking about. The doctor later on told me, get on the bed and put out your left arm. And I did as he told me. He rubbed my hand and then put it in and he didn't let me see what it was. Show me your hand where the implant was inserted. Yeah, this is where they put it, and this is the mark that it left when they took it out. Did you know what it was at the time? I didn't know what it was and what it was for. Did Mary ever tell you what was happening? No, she never told us what it was and like what was happening till they put this thing in. How many girls in total had that implant? We were all nine. nine. Two black Americans and the rest of us Kenyans. She took us and checked us that if, if we have in HIV and AIDS, but we were negative all of us. Then she took us to have again, the check us if we were pregnant. We were not. That was one of the very rare times in which the children set foot into a hospital or any health facility. At the Dows, there were no medical services. They will say that uh, you guys, you like everything medicine all the time. They'll say when a child gets sick, you just give him water only and the child will be okay. When somebody gets sick, they say this is all drama. There was one time there was a boy named Amos. He got hit on the side of his hip with a heavy bench. Then the blood got clogged here and he started getting sick. They tried to explain this to Greg and Mary Rose, but then they kept on saying it's drama. One of the women named Williter took the boy secretly to the hospital. When they later on realized he was taken to the hospital, Mary Rose called him and take, took out the needles that he had in his hands and put a, like a white tape around it and said, this is just drama, go and play with the other kids. When he comes back and tells them, I'm not feeling good, he says, she says, this is just drama, go back and play with the kids. The next day, he would, like he was terribly sick. They tried to, they could real, they saw now that this boy is very sick. So they tried to take him to the hospital, but it was too late. Amos Kipkemoi died. He was only eight years old. Joyce Koske was a matron at the home when he died. She recalls in excruciating detail the chilling trail of events that led to Amos's death. When she learned about his illness, Joyce sneaked him to a nearby clinic without the knowledge of the Dows. I call Mary Rose, uh, no, Gregory Da. Will you please help me? The, yeah, the, the doctor says it's not, it's not going to treat the boy. Please rush him to the Capadet Hospital. He told me, ah, this is a drama. This is a drama, Joyce. I says, please, the doctor says you can rush him to the Capadet. He says, no, that's a drama. 
you see the drama and you see that child is so sick and then in the morning the woman still be please Amos didn't wake up go and help go and check on him as so I, I hold the boy I ran to the I ran towards Gregory because he was down to the office I said hey Gregory why don't you help me Amos is still sick he hold the boy like this rush him in the, he gave it to me rose on the door this yeah Gregory Gregory get the guy get the guy Rush him to the Capcadet Hospital, but it was too late. It was too late for him. There he died there. Miros keeps saying, Yes! It's done. At Amos's home in Chemoy Ben, a visit opens up the family's old suppressed wounds. They thought we had answers on how Amos met his death. This is where my grandchild was buried in 2014, she tells us. Speaking to us on condition that we conceal her identity, Amos's grandmother narrated how she painfully tried to get information on what exactly happened just for closure. <laughs> There were three mysterious deaths at the Dow Children's Home between 2008 and 2017. Amos and a young girl named Jessica both died out of complications from lack of medical care. They were buried at their parents' homes. That wasn't the case for James Kipkirui, who was only one and a half years old when he died in 2012. Gregory and Mary Ross were in Kericho. And uh, at night they called me and said that, uh, please, can you go to the home? And uh, that was on 2012. And check on the boy. The guns are telling me that uh, James Kipkrui is not uh, is is motionless, you know. Mm -hmm. So when I came, I found the boy and already died. When they came, they told me to go look for the grandmother. Fortunately, I found the grandmother with the mother of the child. I explained to them, and I brought them. Well, on my way, on our way here, Gregory told me that, uh, can you tell them that we can bury the child here? When we got here, the guys who were splitting the fine wood had already dug the, the grave. So the boy, the child was buried here. For a burial to happen, you require permits, yes. which you get from the chief and other authorities. Yes. Was that done? It wasn't done. I explained to Gregory, he said that uh, he has his own constitution. This is a, a small America in a village of Cap City He said that that is, that is a waste of time. He refused. And that is why... When we came, they had already dug the grave. He wanted to do it very quickly. So I decided I jump on that fence. I went to Geoffrey's. Geoffrey was not there. He was in Eldoret. But on my way to, to his house, I met with some guys, a pastor and some, and some other three guys who had gone to pray for Geoffrey's wife. They said that uh, we were coming in there to greet the children. I also explained to them what had happened here, and uh, we came together. So. Coincidentally, as we were coming from that gate, Gregory and Mary was down and the grandmother and the mother of the child were bringing the body. So we came here, we prayed, and the body was, uh, was buried. I told, let's inform the, the chief's office. He told me, Davis, I've told you several times that uh, you guys, you like meetings, you know. He said that in America you don't, you go, you go, you go. It's not about, uh, it's not about talking and having meetings and, you know. So, but later on, after a week, I met with the chiefs. I told that, I explained to the chief. So you did inform the authorities uh, that a body, a child had died and the body was buried here, but yes. nothing was done about it. Yes, yes. And uh, I also went to, to D Bomet Child Children's Department. Mm -hmm. I met some guys in the office. I explained about this and uh, how the mistreatment of the children. 
There was a child again who died by the name Jessica, and uh, this child was very sick. She looked like uh, she was uh, dehydrated. Eh? And uh, I called them. They used to, to stay in Kericho Tea Hotel. So I called Gregory and told, it seems like Jessica is not feeling well. So right there, Mary Rose was there with Greg. She picked the phone from Gregory and uh, yelled at me and said, Davis, your time is up. Go home. When the rest of you learned about the deaths of three of your colleagues and how the bodies were handled, how did you feel about that? We felt very terrible because like, we wanted like, the kid to be taken to their home so that the parents and the family can do something better about it. Because like, uh, James was put into a box and then just put in the ground. There was like nothing they did about it and we don't feel it was so right for them to do that. The community here describes their relationship with the Dows as cold. They were only allowed into the home when there were guests from the United States and the Dows had to put on a good show. They built a perimeter wall to keep everyone away and the children within the compound. The children were only allowed to go out on very special occasions. Geoffrey Ngatich was not just a neighbor of the Dows, but the landlord who leased the property to the family. He thought they were helping the community. His affection towards the couple changed over the years when he learned of suspicious activities within the home. I could hear children uh, crying loudly, um, yelling actually in pain. So I could run to the fence because this fence was sealed. There was no entrance to my place. So I could come and, and climb up the fence and shout at the workers and ask them what was going on. Why were they beating the children? Then, um, then they, they could stop beating them and then I could call um, uh, the, the Krugori and, and his wife and tell them about the same. Then the following day they could come and tell me that they, they have taken action. So um, what I witnessed was actually uh, cruelty to children. How the children were being punished, they will be told to go to line up, a child will be told to look, uh, to face the wall. Okay. And uh, there will be no meal for, for that. If, if it's lunch time, the child will not get lunch, same as in the evening. There was also this, uh, this bag, uh, the sacks that we put in the maize. Yeah. They will saw that those, uh, those sacks, for the kids, whoever is not good, that is how they were punishing the children. It was like beating up an animal, not a human being. They take a pipe, one of those water pipes, then they start beating the boy up until at times even they'll tell him to kneel down, put bricks on their backs, and then they're going to get beaten. When child was in, get in trouble, like telling, other, telling another kids bad words, they used to put the soap on their mouth. That's what I saw. And I says, why did, why having the soap on the mouth? He says, uh, it is because he say, he's talking a lot. He can shut the mouth. There was two kitchens. Their food was prepared in one kitchen. And then our food was prepared in the other. And like the kids ate from a bowl at lunchtime. They told you, when you put your fists together like this, is how you, how much food you need. So they do this to your fist and that's how much food you get on your plate. And they said, that's enough. For supper time, you eat out of a CK cup, and that's enough for you for till tomorrow, then you get more. If you go for more food, then you're going to get punished because you're not allowed to go for more food. For almost a decade, the children suffered in silence, not knowing where or who to run to for help. For the workers, being sucked, among other threats, forced them into silence. September 2017, the truth finally came out. I understand he was uh, totally drunk and he dragged uh, one of the girls to, uh, to where he was sleeping and um, he defied the girl and unfortunately he forgot to close the door. So some young boys followed them. So the boys actually found them in the act. Uh, this is where the boys peeped through that window and saw Gregory defiling one teenager who was, uh, who was here too. And that is how this whole thing came out. The boys were laughing and saying that he's having sex with him. With After Gregory had sex with him, he, uh, he sent to, to call her sister by the name Understand he wanted to, to use that girl again. That girl refused to go in and she went back to the to classroom. Gregory went down and beat that girl thoroughly, removed uh, her hair piece 
and the whole thing blew up. Gregory assembled the kids and said that if you are not happy here, the gate is open. So the kids started jumping over the fence everywhere. Nancy and another girl escaped. They reported the matter to the authorities. And the chief told them, go to the police station, I can solve that problem. So next day, Davis, the chief elder, and Ellen, the neighbor for that school, for, for torture and so we went to, to the police station and my mother and we, then we went and reported everything to DO and DC. Gregory learned beforehand that the authorities were after him. He fled the country, becoming a fugitive of justice. Mary Rose was arrested in Nairobi as she prepared to exit the country. She was charged in a sotic court with two counts of cruelty to children and two counts of failing to protect children from sexual exploitation. Court records show that she was released on a 50,000 shillings fine after serving five months in custody. She left the country soon after, joining her husband in the United States. Authorities had the family planning implants removed and all the 83 children reintegrated into the community. Back in the U.S., the Dows have settled down in the state of Pennsylvania. NTV Investigates found them at their home in Lancaster. The family has kept away from the public eye ever since the Lancaster community caught wind of the story. We tried to get answers from the couple, but the house was locked from inside. Maggie Ruto is a Kenyan living in the United States. Her intervention to push for justice for the Boito children has raised awareness in the U.S. about the allegations against Gregory and Mary Rose. She did a good job. Her case is compounded by the fact that Gregory is in fact a convicted child molester and a registered sex offender in the state of Iowa. It was a sexual abuse on his own daughter from his first marriage and he was actually convicted. His uh, wife from the first marriage did present a detail, detail information about what transpired with the daughter. NTV obtained these documents from the Iowa District Court showing that Gregory was charged with the crime of having lascivious acts on his daughter in 1996. It further details the events that took place in his house so gruesome and disturbing to air on national television. Gregory pleaded guilty to the charges. The 60-year-old did not spend time in prison, but was on a two-year probation until 1998. Maggie sought the help of the Kenyan Women in the U.S., an initiative led by Lily Richards in the push for justice. Kwitu has been collecting signatures in a petition seeking the extradition of the Dows to face charges in Kenya. He sexually molested little children. Some children uh, are dead under very uh, suspicious um, circumstances. And many these kids were abused emotionally, uh, psychologically, physically. But the Dows have maintained their innocence in the wake of the allegations. In an interview with the Lancaster online news website, Gregory says... The neighbor and a former employee got a few rebellious teenage girls to lie and get his property back. Kenyans are highly volatile people. It's sad to say we live in a society where people are guilty until proven innocent. So, yes, so, so this is the title which I have. Geoffrey, the owner of the property, refutes these claims. This was purely lease, a nine-year lease. Uh, he came to lease in, in to, uh, April 20, uh, 2008. April 2008. So the lease actually expired in uh, 2017, April. By the time uh, the, this act uh, was discovered, that is in, in September, the lease had already expired. And they had, they had, they had not even up updated uh, the rent. So they, they were having my rent of about uh, six months. It's just impossible for people to let you live in their community for close to nine years. And then on the last year, they decide, oh, wow, we just want to take your land. Um, that's not what, that's not what, I don't believe that's what happened.
Nearly two and a half years since the Dao family children's home was closed and the community here in Boito has yet to make peace with what happened here. Among the concerns they have raised is how was a convicted child molester and a registered sex offender allowed to set up a children's home in the country and take care of vulnerable children? And how did the events at the Dao family home go on for about a decade without being detected by the authorities, that is, the local administration and the children's department? <laughs> The Department of Children's Services under the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection is responsible for registration of orphanages and ensuring the rights of children are protected. The department acknowledges licensing the DAOs to set up in Kenya in 2008. They even renewed their operating license in 2011, 2014 and 2017. Gregory Dow, who was the director of the home, is a convicted child molester and a registered sex offender back in the U.S. How come the department did not do a proper background check before registering the home? These people come through the immigration. They have work permits. Yeah, so it is us, and I've given you, I've stated very clearly, it is us when we are working with them, with the other stakeholders. Remember, my work is that we en enlighten the children about their rights. That's yeah. fine, and I understand that. Mm -hmm. I understand that that's, that is work that is being done now. My question is, mm -hmm. why was it not done in 2008 when a convicted child molester came and registered a children's home? It is, for, for me, I don't know about what you are talking about. For me, I'm saying... There was a manager, and it is the collaboration of the department plus the other arms of government plus other stakeholders on the ground which enabled this case to come out. Would you say that the officers on the ground did not capture the accurate you know, nature of the events at the Dow family home? An issue of children, it takes a long period. Yeah? And it is not a one, one event. I've even given you an example of uh, when sometimes we get reports, when we go, we find the reports are not as indicated. So in my case, in, in my view, the Area Advisory Council, they did what was within their, their law. Would you say they failed in their job then? That is my position. Yeah. I don't want to be repeating the same thing the same time. I have given you the specific question. The specific answer. You are continuing, continuing on the same. There were three deaths at the Dao family children's home um, during the period of the, the Dao's stay here in Kenya. One of the children, a boy by the name Kipkirui James, was actually buried within the home. Are you aware of that? I'm not aware. I'm not aware. You're not even aware about the, the health care services that were being provided there or lack of them? I'm aware about the health services, but I'm not aware about the deaths. Yeah. Normally, when there is a death in a CCI, there is a report which is given. Yeah. So you're not given a report about that? I'm not, I'm not certain about that, unless I, I'm not certain about that. Unless I find out uh, more from, from uh, our records. Yeah. But uh, for that one, I'm not aware. So do you say the children's department was not in touch with what really was happening? What do you mean by that? By not knowing, not being aware of what was happening. You have we all been on the ground. Yes. You interviewed my officer on the ground. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yeah? So for me, I'm, I'm not aware of what you are asking now here. The County Directorate of Children's Services in Bomet, whose jurisdiction the home is under, monitored inspection visits and received reports through the Konoin Sub-County Area Advisory Council. They say they were not aware of suspicious activities at the Dow home for the nine years they were in the country until the events of September 2017 became public. We moved very fast to close this institution and do the tracing 
we did the tracing for the 83 children those who had the uh, close relatives okay we reintegrated them the family home was registered in 2008 yes. and you only found out in 2017 mm -hmm. that's about 9 years yes. for all this while how did this happen undetected before then before the, what happened in 2017 everything was going on well okay but when the public now uh, uh, reported this case when we went there we interrogated the children that is when we came to realize that uh, this is what he did in that period this is a picture from uh, the family's website yes. mary rose with the six of the children from the family home could you just have a look at that picture mm -hmm. and tell me what you think is going on these children are somewhat traumatized one is yawning that means maybe they are malnourished maybe they are they have some uh, lack of food. Then would you say your inspectors and your officers on the ground mm. did not do their job in the right manner? According to children, even the workers, when we asked them, why is it that they had never told us about this information? They told us this director used to threaten them. Eh? That if you say this, then we are going to suck you from this institution. So these workers, the social workers, they used to live in fear. Eh? When they knew that we are fixing the home, they ensured that everything was in order. Nehemiah Kones was the children's officer in charge of Konoin constituency at the time of the Dao stay in Boito. He, alongside the Area Advisory Council, chaired by Thomas Bett, the assistant county commissioner at the time was responsible for inspecting the home and assessing whether children's rights were being adhered to. But in this report, dated 23rd October 2013, Kones writes, The children are treated at Kapkatet Hospital and nearby Mogogo Sheik Health Center. London. Kones and the Area Advisory Council gave the facility a clean bill of health in their reports, which was not reflective of the state of affairs at the home. Residents we spoke to say he was aware of the activities at the home but chose to ignore. He denies. It was an application, not full application. As a father, I felt so, so bad. Did the local administration say the chief? of the area visit the home at any time there was one time he visited the place when he brought in one of the children yeah. like there were two twins and that's the time he came in to to that place did he get in your um, sense an understanding of what really was going on there he wasn't told about anything that was going on there but i think he knew because he was the friend of gregory and they mostly they were talking the area chief, John Chiruyot, says he had no knowledge of anything regarding the Dows. His office, though, is located only two kilometers from the home. In a Samekana, we Mzungu Alkuan Atumia, what to area he, Kufanya Yum and Boyak and Wanyamazi. Situis as Alkuan Atumia, Kazabu, Akuna Mutu and Lukuan Ajua, Syria, we Mzungu. Kunakisa Cham Toto and Baya Lukufa Pale, Akaziko Hapo, Najuanin Kusum Jabu. Eh, me bad to secure a pesa you kit. Mimbato <laughs> The children were reintegrated by the children's department upon the closure of the home in September of 2017. I'm told Gregory had a Beatrice joined a local high school where she's had challenges learning Kiswahili. 
At the DAOs, speaking in any language apart from English was an offense. Have you received any form of counseling ever since leaving the home? I haven't received any yet. Do you ever think about what happened to you there and does it trouble you? It troubles me a lot and I always think about it because like every time my, there's some things my grandmom can't do for us. So when I'm just there doing my studies or something, a lot of things of what happened comes back to me. Then it just like starts disturbing my mind and everything. If you met Greg today, say he's brought back to the country to face charges, how do you feel about that? I feel so like terrible to see him. I wouldn't be ab even like able to go up front to him because I just seem so terrible. I can't even forgive what he's done to us and everything. What would you like to be done to him? He'll just like I just want him to face like the government and the law so that he can know what he's supposed to do and what he's not supposed to do. I just want him to face the charges of what he has done against all of us. These are poor children, orphans who have nobody. He was supposed to be the person who protects them. So he needs to go back and face justice, both him and his wife. But Maggie wants the Dow's charged in the United States. Mary Rose Dow was convicted in Kenya for two counts of child cruelty. And um, she managed to pay $500 and was given back her passport. It's very disturbing because after all that had happened, these children, um, their health implications, um, the, what, what they're going to suffer, the trauma that they had to go through, and they will continue to go through for the rest of their lives, was only worth $500. NTV Investigates has learned of a secret joint probe between Kenyan authorities and the FBI. Several people who were either directly or indirectly involved with the home have been questioned and bombed by detectives. Sources have also told us that James Kipkirui's body could be exhumed as part of evidence gathering and his remains interred at his parents' home. For the rest of the children, the events of 2008 to 2017 will remain a dark chapter of their life story, innocence lost by the unthinkable crime of a couple they called parents. Edmund Nyabola, NTV Investigates.